thanks for, for coming this early in the morning. So um, I expected just one or two tables at this time of day, so that's nice. Um, to start off um, the presentation today, um, I'll just quickly tell you what you can expect in, in the next hour or so. Um, so as the headline indicates, we're going to talk about the American Bar and the Savoy. Um, I'm going to take you from the very beginnings to 2011, which is today. Um, it's, it's a bit of a, of a visual tour, a bit of a, um, I'm going to show you some, some pictures of the American Bar, which you might not have seen, as some things I, I found in the archives at the Savoy. Um, we're going to showcase some of the drinks, some of the, 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 the drinks we're making today, um, which are all kind of inspired by uh, the classics. Um, and also, uh, you will have the opportunity to taste uh, uh, a one-off uh, daiquiri. Now, um, Eric Lawrence, my head barman. So, uh, some of you obviously think, right, where is he? Um, I thought the same. No. Um, he, he, he asked me to, to tell you um, that he would have loved to be here, but uh, he'd rather be at the Côte d'Azur. So this is where he is now. Um, he is actually um, he is in Cannes uh, working on another um, project, so he would have loved to be here and talk you through it. However, um, we have uh, sworn with Nathan here, uh, two Hi senior guys. bartenders uh, in, in my team, um, who will uh, do the drinks today. Now, you will see a lot of pictures of Eric Lawrence, so... Um, no problem uh, that he's not here. Now, um, we will start right in, uh, into the presentation. Um, we're going to talk about how ever since we opened in 2010, uh, and when I was asked uh, to join the Savoy uh, from Claridge's, where I was running the bar previously, um, I asked, okay, um, what is it, what is the, what's the concept going to be like? What, what do you want to do with the American bar? Um, and the answer was, um, actually, we want to retain the same look and feel uh, and, and keep it as classic uh, and in line with the heritage as we can. And I said, right, this is, this is something I can, um, I can uh, subscribe to. This is something I feel uh, very strongly about. But also, um, one of the, the, the reasons why, when I came on board, um, was that I wanted to not only mirror what the American Bar has done over the last hundred and something years, um, but also be relevant for today. So you'll see in some of the, uh, in one of the creations which we're going to taste later, you're going to see how we make uh, a classic which has been around since 1905. We're going to make it relevant for today and interesting, um, while keeping it in line with things which the American Bar always has served over the last hundred and ten years. Now. Um, I call this uh, bridging the gap between the old and new without um, um, alienating punters of today, right? Um, so I broke this down, uh, this presentation today, um, basically in three main parts. Um, as every good bar, it is not the interior and it's, it's, it's not the actual bar counter. Um, it is the people who work in those bars which, who, which make a good bar. Okay, the characters in the American bar obviously are well documented. Um, there have been quite a few um, personalities of note and interesting characters, people who, who, who changed um, the perception of mixed drinks in this country. Um, so this is definitely one, one of the parts I'm going to talk about uh, later on. Now, the second bit is obviously... Uh, uh, the second bit is obviously the actual bar. Okay, what is amazing about the American bar is that this actual room has been there since 1905. So there were drinks served in, well, in 1904 when the American bar moved from the riverside into its current location. So the, the beauty of this room is that, for example, there is a table which you'll see later, um, which was photographed in December 1931. And that table is still at the same position. There's still the same layout, the same windows. Um, so you, you really feel that you're stepping back in time. And this is one of the things which makes the American bar, in my eyes, very, very special. So I'm going to take you through um, the development uh, and the, the, the drastic uh, restorations over the years um, in pictures. Now, um, obviously, no bar complete without cocktails. So the last bit of the presentation uh, will be about cocktails. I will make, well, Nathan and uh, Swan will make um, three drinks in total. Um, 
I can promise you right now that out of those three drinks, um, this is probably the only opportunity you will ever have to try um, a version of those two drinks, um, ever. Now, um, every good um, head barman has to have a cartoon. Okay, obviously, this one here, you see um, Harry Craddock, and this is taken out of the Savoy cocktail book. Um, this one here on the other side um, is, uh, is this gentleman here, Mr. Eric Lawrence. Now, there he is. Um, so, because we, we, we obviously will focus on the head barman, okay? Um, the head barman obviously is a, is a position which has been around forever. Um, let me explain a little bit about a little bit about the, the head barman position. Now, um, when I spoke to to, uh, uh, to Peter Dorelli, for example, about the, the head barman position, I said, "Tell me about uh, head head barman, head bartender. What really is it?" And and what we decided in 2010 to to take those two positions apart. In uh, because nowadays, obviously, as you know, um, all of you will be working in the trade. There is a lot of things. Um, required to run a bar rather uh, apart from, from being a creative and being someone who, who is uh, on, on the pulse of the time and does, uh, does exciting new things has a, has a, uh, a, a palette who is an artist and then there is the you know the cost control the you know the staffing the recruitment the the the, the p l so what we decided is that um, we, we break those two positions apart um, which means I am the bar manager and Eric Lawrence is the, Eric Lawrence is the head barman okay? because Eric Lawrence obviously is um, the creative brain behind the developments the American bar has taken ever since I put in the first menu. Yeah? Um, he's been crucial in making um, or establishing procedures and styles and you will see some of the um, the techniques, as one of will, will, will show you later on, which are, um, which are solely, uh, um, we were able to train on those techniques because of his passion for the industry. Now, um, head barman is um, a crucial, um, is a crucial part of um, of the, the history of the Savoy. So I will focus on the eleven head barmen um, we had ever since. We open now. Having said that, there are obviously always um, one person alone doesn't make a bar, right? So there, there is there are the bar backs, there are the the, the servers, there are the the, uh, the hosts to make the American bar what it is and what it was. Um, as you'll see when we talk later on about the head barman, I only mentioned the dates where they actually been head barman, but some of them have been working in the American bar for. 25 years before they actually became head barman. So maybe one day one of those two will be the head barman of the Savoy and that is what the American bar is about, uh, long liberty, heritage, um, something which, which will be there after we're gone. Okay? Now I'll talk a little bit about, I'll talk a little bit more about um, the actual American bar. This picture here is a, a postcard of the actual Savoy. Now as you can see, I'm not sure if you can see it, um, it says uh, bar and restaurant, okay? Um, for those of you who are not familiar with the term American bar, American bar was basically a, a title which was um, given to an alcohol serving establishment when they served American style drinks. So mixed drinks, um, for lack of a better word, cocktails, okay? So instead of just cherry, port, uh, um, your claret, um, if you would serve mixed drinks, you would get the, you know, you would put above your door American bar. Okay, there were quite a few uh, in Europe. The oldest American bar is the uh, American bar in the Hotel de Paris in, in Monte Carlo, which opened three years before the Savoy was built in 1889, and the Hotel de Paris um, American bar opened in uh, 1896. No, 68, 86, that's it. Now, let's not talk about that one. We're talking about this one here. Um, so, American Bar at the Savoy. Now, um, the American Bar was originally, um, or first opened at the Riverside. Okay, as I said, right now, the American Bar is the oldest serving cocktail bar in this country. Okay, um, 
it was originally open at the riverside um, here. It was more like a dispense bar. Okay, when we talk about the very first head bartender Frank Wells, who not many of you uh, will know because he kind of never got to fame, uh, the first really uh, uh, famous head bar head bar mate, uh, Ada Coleman, came in the limelight in 1904. But obviously, it was an hotel which opened in 1889. This one here. Um, there was a bar. There were drinks served, but it was a dispense kind of uh, operation. Now, in um, 1904, it moved where it is now. So those of you who have seen the American bar and who, are, who have come to the Savoy, this location you see there is where it moved in 1904. Back in 1904, it was only the front pit which was open, and it was male only. Okay, so women were not allowed in the bar, and it was only the, the front pit. Yeah, I see people smirking. Um, so it was only the front bit which was open to public. Uh, and then there was a little dispense store, and you'll see that later on, and I will point it out to you in my little uh, uh, visual presentation of the American Bar Through the Ages. Um, but it has evolved from this particular spot. It was in 1904 since 2011, where we are now. Now, um, the Savoy obviously has, um, has played host to, to anybody um, through the ages. This is a photograph taken in 1931, um, which, which if you compare it with this one here, it is still the very same. Now in case, and this is just a little bit of, um, of um, you know, useless information, um, but when the Savoy was the very first hotel which actually had neon lights to say their name, say the name of the hotel. Now the reason why it's green is because green was the cheapest. And they didn't know if it is a success or not. If I have to take it down a week later because people are complaining, so they said, yeah, let's do it green. And then if it doesn't work out, we take it off again. Um, now, as you might know, um, this street here is the only street in the UK which you actually go the wrong way. So the reason for that is you drive in here rather than on the left. So you drive on the, the, Savoy, the Savoy Way here. So this place is called Savoy Court. You actually drive on the right, not on the left. The reason for that is, uh, once you drive in, and the, the doorman came, if you drive in on the left, there's the driver there. But you don't want the driver to help out of the car, you want the lady to be helped out. So they said, okay, we reverse the, the traffic, and so when the, when the car drives in now, the doorman can open the door and Madame stepping out straight into the Savoy. That's the reason why this street is still the only street in the, in the UK where you drive the wrong way. It's characters. Um, as I said, 1889 is when we first opened, and for those of you who have um, seen the program about the reopening of the Savoy, um, we have seen an amazing amount of candidates over uh, through the refurbishment. We saw all in all, uh, well, we received more than 25,000 applications for um, uh, for employment in the Savoy. For the head barman position, we received 800. Uh, applications um, for mine for my uh, the bar manager's position at the time just below 850 um, applications for um, for their position. Now I have a list of all the people who applied. So every time I bump into someone, <laughs> now I know I know you did. Um, but um, that aside, obviously it's all about the characters. Um, it is about um, the people who actually interact with you at your table. It is it is the person who who smiles at you when you walk through the door, um, that is what makes the American bar the American bar, okay? Um, it is a thin line in being such a, uh, being a bar with such a trade reputation where everyone is interested in, oh, what they're gonna do, is it this, is it that, um, to still keep in mind that the, the main reason why the American bar is there is to serve guests and to make guests happy and to provide an offering which today's palate is willing to receive. Now, um, it's characters. Obviously, uh, a long history. Um, it's over, over the last hundred years. Um, when we go through uh, those eleven uh, personalities, um, obviously, most of you will, will, will know a few, okay, or, or know at least two. So one is Eric Lawrence, which is the, the current one, and one is Harry Craddock, which you know uh, wrote the Savoy Cocktail Book or compiled it, let's say. Um, but there were obviously other people who were um, engaged uh, and, and, and were 
part of the American bar over the last 100, 100 plus years. Now the first one is someone who, who never gets talked about simply because he was in charge of the dispense bar. So the only reason and the only proof we have that he was involved at the time was because there was a, a purchasing register in which he signed out um, a, a barrel of scotch, 1889 head barman Frank Welch. So this is why we know that in 1889 we already had a head barman. Okay? Um, the first really famous one, um, and some of you have known it, and we will later on sample a, her signature drink, is Ada Coley Coleman, um, who like myself worked at Claridge's before she joined the Savoy in 1903. Um, the first really character of note, let's say. Um, obviously, cre having created a signature drink which is still uh, served today, very, very interesting. Now, as you can see, she's been there for uh, just about 22 years. Um, and keep in mind that at this time, women were not allowed in the bar. So, so she was not only a woman, but she was in charge of the drink offering. So very, very, um, let's say, um, cutting edge, um, not very use, uh, very unusual at the time. Now, um, which brings me unusual at the time. Now, a lot of people through the refurbishment were talking about, oh no, you can't do this, you can't do this, no, don't, da da dee, da da do. What the Savoy has done over the last 100 years, it was always has been kind of pushing the boundaries. And we're creating something which we're new. The Savoy was the first hotel in the world to have a lift. Okay? We didn't call it a lift, we called it ascending floor. Because people were scared. Um, so it didn't have any doors. So it was just the floor which slowly, slowly rose and brought you to the first floor. Now, why is that of importance? Um, back in the days, the cheapest rooms were on the top. And the most expensive rooms were on the ground floor because Madame and Sir could walk straight into their room, okay, no stairs. Obviously, with the implementation of a lift, the good rooms were suddenly on the top, okay, where the view was. I mean, the, the Savoy is right next to the tents. So it basically it was a revolution. And people would say, you know, we don't put those, the, the technique in the Savoy. The Savoy is an institution, don't do it, you ruin it, da da dee. And now every hotel has a lift, right? Um, Bathrooms. Um, the Savoy was the only or the first hotel where there was one bathroom for every six rooms. In, in other hotels like the Dorchester, it's a great hotel by the way, um, there was still one bathroom per floor. In the Savoy we had one bathroom per six rooms. And later on the first hotel which actually offered every uh, uh, riverside room would have its own bathroom. Amazing. Now keeping that in mind, pushing the boundaries a little bit. So the next person, Harry Craddock. Harry Craddock, um, obviously, probably one of the most famous uh, head barmen, simply because of his legacy, the Savoy Cocktail Book. As the Savoy Cocktail Book, uh, as we, as well, as I certainly knew when I was a young bartender, um, I saw classics, amazing. I had problems figuring out uh, what the dash is and, and this and that, and what, how I can actually measure that drink. Um, when we compiled our contribution to the Savoy Cocktail Book, uh, which came out at the beginning of this month. And we converted all our recipes in a similar style. So you can, you know, uh, and once you, 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 you get the, the, the hang of it, it's actually, it does make sense. Now, um, Harry Craddock, I'm not sure if, if all of you know, um, actually left the Savoy to go work for the Dorchester. Once again, great hotel. Um, but uh, he wasn't really happy there. I'll just throw this in there. Um, now, Eddie Clark. Uh, Eddie Clark, as you can see, 3942. Um, Eddie Clark, obviously, this is, he's the, the war head barman. Okay? Uh, during the war, obviously, there were, there were blackouts and, and, and restrictions and what have you. But every grand hotel has a story. Um, you know, like in the Titanic, when they played the piano, although the, the, the ship was going down, that kind of thing. So we. Um, served, we still had a bar, um, right in the heart of the hotel, lower ground floor. And um, this is where, where Eddie Clark kept on serving drinks. Um, it had no windows and it was basically, it's really in the heart. So there's, there's corridors all around this room. So if, if one room keeps standing, it will be this room. Uh, funnily enough, I didn't know that, that it was this room. 
And I, uh, and I had the, the, the pleasure of um, going with Peter Dorelli, Salim Khoury, and uh, Victor Gower, who worked there uh, ever since uh, 1950, um, to, to show him my office, where we, where, we, where we did the reopening. So I had my office uh, while we were still closed. And he said, this is the bar where, where we used to serve drinks during the war. I said, really, in my office? So it is, it is, there's a lot of, um, a lot of stories uh, and a lot of um, hardship as well. So Eddie Clark actually um, was, uh, was then drafted in 1942. Uh, he survived the war, but he didn't uh, care to reapply for his new job. So it's a, it's a story which is very close to my heart. Um, when, when I was recruited for the American Bar, I obviously um, um, put an eye on, on Mr. Lawrence uh, ever since he worked in the Purple Bar. Um, then he moved to the Connaught. And um, yeah, and then I slowly, slowly convinced him that this is, this is the way forward. And I did that with, with a lot of, uh, um, of, um, of my staff. Now, Salim Khoury, as you can see, uh, 2003 to 2010. Now, Salim Khoury works with us now. Um, I asked him to come back from retirement to help us be in, be in the American bar, being um, respectful to what the American bar is about. The American bar is not about me. The American bar is about heritage. It is about uh, uh, continued service and about how um, people interact over a hundred years with guests and be, be, be responsible for providing people with a good time. Now, Salim Khoury has been not only the head bartender, um, he has been working in the Savoy for 38 years. So he has been um, in the Savoy and around the American Bar for around 38 years. So obviously this, his experience uh, and his contribution to the reopening of the American Bar is priceless. Um, the amount of times he would point out, you know, Daniel, don't, 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 he's a loony, or um, the amount of times he contributed to, um, actually, Salim, who is this on this picture? Because that person died before I was born. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't know who that person is. And he said, no, oh, it's, it's, it's that person who was, was famous in whatever, the 70s. And I, wouldn't, I, wouldn't, I just wouldn't know. Um, and this is about bringing a little bit of, of, of American bar pre-closure back into the, to the American bar now. Um, another one of, um, of those who used to work in the, in the, in the old American bar is, is Swan uh, he used to He used to work there be, before the closure. And we gladly had him back to make sure that there is some sort of consistency. Now, the last person, um, Mr. Eric Lawrence. Um, from 2010, obviously, um, over the past year, if you find a magazine without a picture of Eric in it, hold on to it, it might be worth a lot of money. Um, he has been instrumental in putting the American bar back on the map for the trade as well as for the consumers, okay? Obviously, as you know, and this would be the moment where, where I would have handed over to him to tell you a little bit about his experience with um, the Diageo World Class uh, competition, which was, obviously, I was on the receiving end of this competition, having to make sure that he gets all the time off to travel the world. Um, has been instrumental. Um, I think when we went to, to New Orleans uh, to test of the cocktail, and it was, uh, the, the award was, was coming up, Best International Bartender. Um, I think Eric traveled like five continents uh, and about 12 countries in a year to be an ambassador for our trade. Um, and, I, and therefore, I think that it's very well deserved that, that Eric won this, 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 uh, this amazing award of Best International Bartender. So, um, shame that he can't be here, but the beauty of that is um, that um, he will now work for about 14 days straight when he comes back from Cannes, so you can come to the America Bar and see him there live. Now, um, visual, okay? Uh, a picture says more than a thousand words. Obviously, Harry Krellock here on the left. Ada Coleman, that's the one I was talking about. First female barmaid, well, first barmaid, 19, uh, 1905. Uh, Peter Dorelli, you know this charmer. Uh, Salim Khoury. Victor Gower, um, that was taken uh, on October 6th um, when we did the, the, the uh, 122nd anniversary. And then obviously, Mr. Eric Lawrence. Um, 
very, very important for me um, to point out how important the characters were and are, and the characters make a bar. Okay. Um, now, the next bit, um, American Bar Through the Ages. Obviously, um, and this is something I can I can speak from from uh, from experience when. When I was asked, okay, you do it, yes, you're in charge, la la la, recruit staff. Um, and I was facing, in the interviews I had and, and with, the, with the people from the trade who I met, I was facing so much, um, let's say, anxiety. Don't, you know, what are you doing with the American Bar? It's going to be, you know, you're ripping the heart out. It's going to be, you know, it's, you can't open it. Who are you, this, that, and the other. But what you will see in the next 10, 15 minutes is that the American Bar has been drastically changed every two decades. It has been, and I will, I will, you will be shocked by the pictures you see. Um, and what we did right now in 2010 is that we have been very um, careful not to touch the 1990 refurbishment, okay? But you will see that the American bar has been changed so drastically um, that all the, the, the fear um, of, oh no, don't do anything to the bar is actually um, something which, if you see those, uh, the, the, the hundred years uh, here in pictures, you'll see, well, they've done it every 20 years. Why not do it this time? But I leave it up to you to judge. Now, the 30s. As I said, um, it moved in 1904 to the river site. Um, at this stage, it was more like an um, assembly of, of, of tables and chairs which were used in, in private events uh, and in the Thames foyer. Now, this is the room I was describing earlier, just the front room. For those of you who have been to American Bar recently, this is the corner table, okay? So you would come down here, the flight of stairs, into the American Bar, and it would then close here, okay? There would be a, there would be a door, and the waiter would come through and say, yes, there's your, your gin and tonic or whatever it is. Now, as you can see here, it is, this was taken in December, the 12th of December, 1931. And most of you will recognize this table. This is what we still to this day call the Royal Circle. The Royal Circle is a table when you walk in, right in the corner. It's always reserved. Um, the same table, the same windows, 1931, okay? Um, and those are the things which I feel so strongly about. When I found those pictures and I scanned them, um, I thought, you know, that's amazing. Um, because there will be Charlie Chaplin, um, Marilyn Monroe, Frank Sinatra, they would not sit on any other table than this table because it's the best table in the house. And this is a, it's a fact. Um, so, 1930s. The next thing, uh, the next two decades later, and this is something which, when I first saw it, I was rather surprised. Um, the American bar was a tiki bar. Okay? Um, bamboo, flowers, um, the whole back bar is all made of bamboo. Um, you can see it here a little better. There is uh, Jolly Johnson. It's all bamboo. Um, you know, Tiki Central in the American bar. Okay? Um, so just imagine what a shock the, the, the regulars from the 1930s had, or everything Art Deco, when then some barman said, uh, or, you know, uh, interior designer, whoever it is, Oh, Tiki is, is a trend, let's, let, let's go for it, you know? Um, so I think that this probably uh, uh, created a bit more of an uproar than, uh, than actually our refurbishment. Now, as I said at the time, um, Johnny Johnson here, um, head barman seemed to have a, a lot of fun. They were wearing little like, um, they were really long, those jackets, yeah, almost to the knee. Um, now, the next one, I uh, thoroughly enjoyed as well once I first saw it. The 70s. Now, when I press the next button, I haven't made a mistake. This is actually the American bar. Okay? Um, this wouldn't be out of place in Shoreditch. Okay? Um, this is, for those of you who have been there, this is still the same bar. It was put in in 1976. So those pictures, obviously employees. Yeah. Um, uh, and this one here, Victor Gower, the person I, I talked to you uh, uh, earlier about, a young Victor Gower. Um, Little actual chairs, okay? Um, I don't know if you can actually spend a whole lot of time there without getting eye cancer. But um, it's, it's, you know, you can see, once again, a drastic change, trying to be um, relevant, yeah? Trying to, to, to not be stiffy, not be 
um, something which is not relevant for today, okay? 1970s. Now, the next picture is, uh, or the next, once again, two decades later, um, is something which you probably will be more familiar with. Um, this one here already looks, you know, a little bit like it does now. A bit of a, a cruise liner um, feel, okay? Um, this gentleman here, um, Peter Dorelli, okay, he still had the hair at the time, like in a, in a nice circle, like a name of the rose. Um, 1990s. In the 90s, they had three minor refurbishments. So the carpet was changed, um, the chairs were changed, but the, the, the structure pretty much stayed the same. Now, as you can see, and I have another picture, which is basically this view, um, the structure in 2010 was not changed, okay? Because of the fear, we were closed for three years. We were, because of the fear of saying, of people saying, oh, you, you ripped the heart out of the American bar. But as you now know, every two decades, it was changed so drastically, you wouldn't recognize it. Now, we decided this time around, we go for a slightly different approach. And um, if you see the, the, the today, you know, obviously slightly cleaner lines. Mr. Swanand, uh, the same bar still, as you can see. Um, the, uh, funnily enough, this picture was taken uh, the night before, no, there was a week before we opened, so we didn't have any stock. So we went to the Simpsons to grab like, you know, bottles of Gordons and Smirnoff and what have you, and just try to, to make it look full. And I just opened a magazine lately uh, about the American bar winning uh, best hotel bar in the world. And I was like, if, if someone sees this picture with, um, with three bottles of, of, uh, of, of whiskey uh, right next to the rum and the vodka, they might think, well, surely someone is, um, is not doing their job right. Now, this one here, as you can see, very similar to the 1990 uh, look there. The, the pillars are the same. The pictures uh, were chosen by Peter Dorelli in 86. Um, they're still all there. We only lost one picture through refurbishment. I'm sure it's in, in, in good hands, I'm positive. Um, the tables, the tables are actually um, from the place where Peter Dorelli worked in the 70s, the Chop House. Uh, the Chop House was part of the Savoy Group, and when the Chop House closed, he said, right, can I have the tables? And they said, yeah, why not? So he moved the tables uh, into the bar, and those tables are over 50 years old. So in the refurbishment, those tables, in case you wonder why they're wobbly, because they're 50 years old. Okay? Um, right. So, through the ages, um, I have um, given you a little bit of a, of a visual tour. I talked to you about the characters. Now, obviously, a bar, and um, let's not be fooled, although it is... Uh, just uh, gone uh, 12.30, I, I'm sure that we're all ready for a drink. Um, Hanky Panky. Hanky Panky is Ada Coleman's signature drink, okay? As I mentioned to you earlier, what we try to do in this Savoy is make classics relevant for today's palette, okay? Um, what we did with the Hanky Panky, and I just briefly flicked the, the recipe um, through here, Obviously, when I, when I first um, wrote the, the menu for the American bar, um, I thought, okay, hanky panky, need to be on there, easy, gin, uh, Italian vermouth, Fanta Branca. Well, it's not that easy. Um, the Fanta Branca, obviously, I love Fanta Branca, but it is a very um, acquired taste. So, the version we're doing here now is um, a bit of one of our um, signatures. Obviously, uh, you know, you will have all seen it before, aging cocktails, um, so we're not going to go into the whole uh, pros and cons. Um, what we did do is, and maybe uh, Swanen's going to uh, talk a little bit about the Hanky Panky um, while he makes it, um, is uh, we, we age different types of gin, different types of vermouth, and different types of, uh, uh, um, of Amaros kind of thing. Yeah? Um, Swanen, is your, does your mic work? Yes, I think so. Hello? No. Right. Um, so, ah, ha, there we go. This, right? So, um, you need your hands, then I can hold it? Yeah. Hello, beautiful people, how are you? <laughs> Good. Let's begin the journey with Hanky Panky, such an emotional and a devotional cocktail for Eric Coleman. 
who used to be the only bartenders, her bartenders at the Savoy Hotel. So here we are stirring the soul, rest in peace for Miss Eric Coleman. What we begin with, always make sure, of course, uh, I'm sure you all the professionals, but I don't have to teach you. Um, what we do here is uh, first make sure the glass is chill. We use here carved ice. Basically, the function behind the carved ice to make sure it settles down the spirit and also the drink um, and doesn't melt so quickly. What we are doing here is stirring the cocktail. That's um, yeah. That's the thank you, thank you, thank you, Daniel. Um, what we have done, we have um, infused it in the barrel, which gives the great oaky flavor. And um, also we have infused with four different types of gin, different types of vermouth, and um, of course the frane branca. It's a great digestive. I should promote that. I can hold this. Thank you. And right. So the, the way we're going to do this is we're going to make um, one drink, which um, we're going to pass around those two tables here, um, and we're going to make as many as. Um, as um, Nathan gets out of the, 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 the second mixing glass, to put in those glasses and um, if we can maybe get them into the second uh, part of the room, into the, the, the back part, part of the room, that will be very good so that everyone gets an opportunity um, to taste. Now, um, lovely. Um, is um, any of my staff here? Ah, it's not really my staff, the head barman uh, of the Beaufort Bar. Uh, Chris Moore, um, if you could give us a hand, that would be lovely. Um, talking about this, actually, while we, while we prepare this, um, something uh, as well, which is it's very close to my heart, this, this presentation, obviously, is based on the American Bar at the Savoy. Now, the American Bar of the Savoy was, till 2010, the one and only bar in the Savoy. That has changed now. Um, what, we, what we wanted to create with uh, the second edition to, uh, to the Savoy, with the Beaufort Bar is a more contemporary, more playful, um, more, let's say, um, cutting edge uh, approach to bartending. Um, for those of you who have not seen the Beaufort Bar, um, it is probably, for me, certainly one of the, the most beautiful um, rooms there is in central London. Um, it is not only uh, beautiful, it is also offers a, an amazing entertainment which, um, which is definitely worth going for um, even without trying Chris's amazing drinks. Now, the, the both of us recently um, changed management, so the, the new manager, uh, Ludovic, uh, is, is here today as well. I Hopefully um, uh, you get a chance later on to meet him. Um, I have um, strong confidence that the Bofa Bar uh, will be here next year and do a presentation. Now, um, the Hanky Panky, um, I will pass this, pass this round here. Um, there we go. Yeah, don't be shy. Um, so, Hanky Panky, good. Now, as you can see, um, we took something um, from 1905 and gave it a little bit of our own twist, let's say, okay? Now, while this is going around, uh, and I know uh, I'm a bit pressed for time, so let's come right next to the, um, to the thing which, which brought some of you here. Um, is, and some of you um, might recognize uh, this bottle here. Mr. Swannell, if you, if you want to uh, just yeah. hold it up for a second. So this bottle there is actually, and I only opened it this morning, um, before when you guys sat down simply because uh, the cork is uh, you know after uh, 80 years wasn't as perky as you as, as you might want so therefore I had to to um, take it out and clean uh, the neck of the bottle but I just opened it today um, this particular bottle was presented uh, to myself and Eric uh, the night before we opened by a member of the Bacardi family um, very, very exciting. This actually has, and for those of you who want to come later on and have a closer look at the bottle, um, has actually a tax seal over the top um, for, of US uh, imports. So it went to, uh, to New York Harbor 
uh, a bottle of, uh, of Bacardi being imported, and that is Cuban Bacardi, obviously made in 1931. Um, and funnily enough, when you, when you check out the label, it doesn't say Oro or Gold or whatever, it just says Bacardi Superior, okay? Um, we went through four of those bottles in the last year, yes, and we were making cocktails with it, okay? Uh, we'll today, there. you get the chance yeah. to have one of, those uh, one of those cocktails, okay? Um, a daiquiri Savoy style. Obviously, that is 1931 Bacardi, shockingly enough, lime juice and sugar. Now, um, would you like to, uh, before we make the drink, would you like to take uh, the, the, the picture opportunity there? Um, now, to preempt um, maybe, maybe uh, a conclusion you might, you might jump to, um, why, why are they using 19, 1930s Bacardi? Um, you know, it's, it's, some of you might think, yes, they should be, you know, they should be in a, in a cupboard somewhere locked up. Um, but you will never get as close to what Harry Craddock would have served his customers than what you're going to experience this afternoon, okay? Um, as you all know, once it's in a bottle, it doesn't change anymore, okay? Obviously, apart yep. from the, the oxi yep. oxidization, oxidation, yep. you know, I'm a foreigner, um, it doesn't change. So, so therefore, this is uh, how Harry Craddock would have served a daiquiri. And Mr. Swanland, if you want to yeah. get involved. Um, now, um, Bacardi 1931. Um, interesting and, and a piece of, of, of history, but as with everything um, related to the, to the American bar and to the Savoy, it is living heritage, okay? It is getting uh, a bartender who worked there in the 1950s, in the 1940s, to come and do a drink behind the bar. It is about using a spirit, uh, you know, which you cannot buy anywhere, which was made uh, and sold in 1931 and making a drink today. To give you guys on a, uh, on a day like this the opportunity to, to sample something which you normally cannot. Um, and um, this is what, what, we, what we felt. Um, and when, when Eric and me first talked about uh, going out to Amsterdam, to the bar show, to, to, um, to Paris, to Berlin, um, it is things where where we feel um, lucky and privileged to be obviously part of the American bar, but also how we have a, not a responsibility, but you know, it would be, it would be rude not to, to share um, what we have there um, with you guys on a day like this. Um, now, Nathan, you're gonna do, you, you're gonna, okay, lovely. Now, um, while they um, prepare, uh, that drink. Are there are there any any questions so far? Anything you guys feel worthwhile asking me? No. Right. Yeah. So so there was no uh, there was a big restaurant on the riverside, the river restaurant, um, and obviously we would serve uh, drinks drinks in the river restaurant, but there was no designated bar counter which a customer could go to. So it was only um, it was only dispense at the time. Um, now, um, talking about um, that particular dispense, uh, Frank Wells um, was not serving any uh, mixed drinks. So, in the in the uh, book which we are currently um, preparing, which comes out on 10th of October, uh, a limited edition um, homage to um, to the last hundred. 110 years uh, plus in cocktail making. Uh, the drink we, we chose to represent best uh, what Frank Wells did is a shot of whiskey, okay? Uh, because that is what he has served until, um, you know, it, it has, uh, let's say, Ada Coleman took over. So how are we, how we doing on the daiquiris? We all ready. And, Lovely, um, let's do it. I need to. Okay. Um, Hello. As we are doing the daiquiri, there are two ingredients missing there, if somebody can guess. We do five ingredients at the American Bar the Savoy Hotel. One is the fresh lime, sugar, and of course the, to rem remember Master Facundo Maso, 50 ml of Bacardi. But uh, there are more two ingredients, if somebody can guess, that'll be great. Anybody, anybody here? Another two ingredients? Anybody? 
it can be a guess. Sorry? Bitters. Bitters. Which bitters you think? Daiquiri chocolate? Or? Yeah. Okay. Um, so let's begin now. I'm going to tell you soon. Okay. So um, what the, the technique um, Swaman is going to going to present now um, is obviously inspired by um, um, Eric's trip to Japan, and what he brought back from there. Uh, is Shall the half shape. Okay, and then um, yeah. we'll see Mrs. Swan in action. Obviously, we do that with every daiquiri ever made in the Savoy, obviously. <laughs> um, Right, so um, once again, same, uh, same thing. One tray for the back, uh, one, tray, uh, one glass for the front. Um, because I've done a few bar shows, obviously in different countries, I would really like to see the glass coming back. Okay, it would be really nice, something uh, different. Now, good. Okay, uh, Chris, if you could, that would be, would be amazing. Okay. Actually, while we edit. <laughs> um, right. That, what can I say? Lovely. Now, so what you, what you will notice, what you will notice when you try the daiquiri, is obviously, um, it is a much more mature product then, um, then let's say you can't compare it to the to the today's Bacardi Gold or uh, Oro. Um, you can't. It's a, it's a very mature rum, and at the, as as some of you might know, this one is a, is a pot still. Okay, so this was made in a pot still versus um, the combination of pot and column they use today. Now, um, because we're pressed for time, um, we just let um, Swan and tell you what the other two uh, ingredients are. Sir, uh, that's what we do. Uh, Thank you, Chris. Daiquiri at the American bar, and the two ingredients are love and passion behind that cocktail making. Um, perfect. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Now, um, what I thought yeah. um, for today, um, and I know that there's a, a time is running out, and I promise you, I will not take uh, any more of your time. But there's one, one last thing, one last drink, which I'd like to share with you. Um, Are you ready? Uh, yes, we, we can. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, right. So, there we go. Um, being proactive, that's good. Um, now, um, I promise you that we start with the next drink this side round. Now, um, the next drink I want to I wanna do is uh, it's very similar along the same lines, and once again, it's a one off. Um, I just thought because you, you missed out on Eric Lawrence, I thought I need to you know bring in the big guns to make up for it. Um, and we're going to make a dry martini, okay? Um, so a dry martini. Coming up. Obviously gin, French vermouth, uh, and, and grapefruit bitters. Uh, yeah. Now, obviously um, we don't. We're going to use Gordon's gin this time. Um, and we're going to use it um, from 1931. Okay, so we're going to make you a, a, a dry martini as Harry Craddock would have made it. Okay, um, the bottle there, if we can, uh, once uh, Mr. Swanon has measured them out, uh, is another uh, great addition to um, our, let's say, uh, history cabinet of, of drinks. Um, um, this one here, and if I can just have the flat cap, where is it? The cap of the bottle, lovely. So this one here is actually probably the most ingenious uh, invention, a flat cap, okay? Um, some people even collect those. Um, they're better than cork for unaged spirits, the best thing. When I opened this one here, um, last year, uh, Bausch in Amsterdam, I flicked it open like it was just freshly put in place. Um, 
Now this bottle here is a 1931 um, Gordon's, Gordon's Gin. What you will notice, uh, and for those of you who had a chance to try the Bacardi, um, obviously with the Bacardi, um, slightly more mature. With the Gordon's, there is obviously um, a subtle hint of oxidation, as it will always be with all spirits which are over 80 years old, okay? You know, you know what I mean. Now, but what you will find is that the Gordon's actually has a little tinge of malted wine um, flavor, which actually, and this is why I added the grapefruit bitters to it, together with the grapefruit bitters, it just actually brings it together quite nicely. Um, now, once again, um, Bombay Sapphire is obviously um, uh, a gin which is very close to my heart. Um, today, we're going to uh, use uh, uh, this 1931 Gordon's just to give you an opportunity to try this. Okay? Um, we do make uh, those drinks in the American bar. Um, they come 250 pounds uh, short, uh, well, a cocktail. So we do not charge for the lime and lemon. Um, now, um, there's two drinks being prepared right now. Um, obviously, the, the, the tray again. And then we have um, the glass, which this time starts at this table here. Once again, I shall try. Um, now, sorry, sorry. after we, um, we uh, Chris, if I can ask you one last time, this is, I promise this is the last drink. Um, What I wanted, uh, this is a little bit, how we do it, like the, the 11 glass twist. Um, so those last, um, those last two drinks um, will bring my presentation to an end. Um, what I wanted um, to share with you uh, over the last hour or so was my passion for uh, the American bar and my passion for the London bar trade and the role the American bar has played in it and hopefully will play in the future. Um, I feel that in the hands of, of a Swan and a Nathan and Eric, um, the American bar can be what it was, what I tried to show you over the last hour, the, the drastic development uh, in the American bar, the two decades uh, change it, under, it underwent and also talk to you a little bit about the characters of the American bar and hopefully um, I, I uh, inspired you to come and visit us okay um, especially over London cocktail week we're gonna create a, a, a cocktail museum in our Savoy museum so all the Savoy stuff comes out cocktail stuff yeah, comes in um, so very exciting I uh, don't want <laughs> to do too much PR because there's only about space for 30 people at a time um, I, I really enjoyed uh, having uh, to spend an hour with you guys today. Um, I hope you enjoyed nice. it and um, I'll see you all in the American Bar.